Good afternoon, or good evening. I'm Mike Sprague. I'm the director of the Wilson Center's Polar Institute. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to today's book talk with Polar Institute program assistant and author of a new, important, and I might add beautifully written book, Michaela Stith, entitled, Welp, Climate Change and Arctic Identities. Michaela is an important, new, and informed voice in the Arctic. Her perspectives have been shaped by her experiences and her ideas informed by the future she and other young leaders would like to craft and ensure. But before we get started, let me thank Ogunik Corporation for their continued support of the Polar Institute. They simply enable us to conduct our work here in the United States and abroad, and they bring to you programs like today's event. I also want to thank my many colleagues at the Wilson Center to include the Canada Institute, our Global Europe Program, our Environmental Change and Security Program, as well as our colleagues at Dartmouth, the Institute of Arctic Studies of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding, the Hart Leadership Program at Duke University as well. We hope that today's program is interactive, so we encourage you to email your questions at polar at wilsoncenter.org, polar at wilsoncenter.org. It's now a pleasure to introduce my friend and colleague and the moderator of today's program, Dr. Melody Brown Perkins. Many of you know Melody. She is the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies and senior associate director of the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding at Dartmouth. Among her many leadership roles, Dr. Birkin holds a variety of international positions to advance global science cooperation, inclusion, and sustainability. She's an elected member of the founding governing board of the International Science Council, chair of the US National Academy's Board on International Scientific Organizations, and recently served as a scientific advisor to the 2021 ISC report, Unleashing Science, Delivering Missions for Sustainability. Melody, thank you for joining us today and thank you for leading this important discussion. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Mike. Thank you so much. It is such an honor to be here. And um, as Mike said, I'm uh, the director of the Institute of Arctic Studies at Dartmouth in the John Sloan Dickey Center for International Understanding. And it is one of uh, one of our honors is to be so closely associated with the Wilson Center and to get to work with folks like Mike Sfrega and also with program assistant Michaela Stith, who I met in about 2018 at a meeting in, in, in the Arctic in Finland. We were in a lunch line together of all things, I believe. She told me she was from Alaska and I happen to be also from Fairbanks, Alaska. She's from Anchorage. And so we had a wonderful conversation. I was enthralled. She just inspired me with all she was doing. And you get to hear about that today. Um, I, we stayed in touch. Uh, I invited her. I'm been so inspired by her writing and her thinking. I invited her into my class at Dartmouth on the issues of science policy and diplomacy to talk about the importance of youth voices um, being expressed and heard around the world, which is what she is doing. And I'm just honored to be part of this book talk and with this incredible group of panelists who I've met already and now you get to hear from as well. So what uh, we're going to do today, the book that, uh, well, <laughs> Climate Change and Arctic Identities is a fantastic book. If you've not read it, you'll have a chance to, uh, there's, I think, links on the website. But what I did want to say is today we're going to focus on the policy audience. We know the Wilson Center is often bringing in international voices, international ideas, and people focused on policy. So those will be the pieces of the book that we bring out today with this group of panelists. And that's very intentional by the author. And, and again, I think it'll be a really interesting conversation. Um, and we're really going to look that at, at her interest in the policies uh, where environmental ideas and identity intersect. So you are in for an absolute treat. Um, and then how we're going to do this is that we're going to start with some, uh, with Michaela's going to give some book reads, some, as it is a book read talk, a virtual talk. She's going to read a little bit from her book and ask both, she is also, she's going to reflect, but also ask her panelists, and I'm going to talk to the panelists about reflecting on each passage. Then we're going to, after those uh, four conversations, we're going to move to a, a, a short reflection by the panelists, and then we're going to open it up to your questions, which uh, Director Sfrega just just let you know are at uh, polar at wilsoncenter.org is where you can uh, write those questions into the panelists and to the author. 
So with no more ado, because this is all about this book and these conversations, I'd like to introduce the author, Michaela Stith. Thank you, Melody. So as you all have mentioned, uh, my name is Michaela Stith. I'm a lifelong Alaskan from Anchorage, Alaska, and currently I'm a program assistant at the Polar Institute where I coordinate and organize events and publications, such as our blogs, Polar Points on the Wilson Center website, Navigating the Poles on the Security Beat, as well as our scholarly publication, Polar Perspectives. And importantly, I created the Arctic in 25 Years initiative at the Wilson Center with its a youth symposium that centers Arctic youth in policy discussions about its future. Most recently, in May 2021, I published a travel memoir and my first book entitled Wealth, Climate Change and Arctic Identities. This book focuses on the year and a half that I lived abroad in Tromsø, Norway, 660 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Prior to the Polar Institute from 2018 to 2019, I was working as a Heart Leadership Fellow and later as an Associate at the Arctic Council Indigenous People Secretary which works under the direction of the six indigenous organizations with permanent participant status in the Arctic Council. In Wealth, I tell intimate stories from my personal experience and integrate them with interdisciplinary scholarship and news about Arctic policy, social justice, and environmental science. And ultimately, this is to illuminate the interconnectedness of racism and environmental degradation in the age that we're currently living in, that is the Anthropocene, which entails mass extinction and biodiversity loss, rises in global temperature and land use change. And as you know, if you read the book, uh, the Arctic experiences many of these changes faster than the rest of the world and people are intimately affected by them. Importantly, this is the first public event for WELP and I know many family and friends who supported the book before it was published may be watching. So I really wanted to thank you and say, I appreciate you and all the colleagues who supported this initiative and about here today. So to start off the event, I'll read an excerpt that really illuminates where factors about race and the environment collide in policy in my life and in other people's lives. And I have the book right here, but I will be reading from my screen. So without further ado, this is from chapter six. By my first birthday, my family had already taken me fly fishing on the Russian River and dip netting in the Kenai River, the traditional homelands of Atna and Dena'ina people. The name Kenai comes from the Kanatse Indian tribe, a sovereign, independent Dena'ina nation. Catching and sharing fish among the tribe is the way they always lived. Therefore, federal laws acknowledge that the Kanatse's right to fish for subsistence is crucial to their self-determination their ability to freely pursue their economic, social, and cultural development. Yet, back in the 1980s, the state of Alaska deliberately misinterpreted the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, or ANILCA, to deny special privileges to subsistence users on the Kenai. The state gave commercial fishermen and sports fishermen just as much access to fisheries, if not more, and the vast influx of Anchorage residents created a cash economy on the Kenai Peninsula. Rather than allowing their right to fish for the community, the state enforced a socioeconomic shift among Dena'ina. When I participated in Kenai dip net fishing at the height of King Salmon season as a toddler, thousands of fishermen lined the river's shallow banks. My dad taught me the fight with the fish was the most exciting part. The bigger the fish, the bigger the fight, and the more tall fish tails he could tell. The fishers dangled five foot wide nets in front of 20 foot long wooden and metal poles. And the goal was to stick the nets as far into the river as possible. As the salmon swam with the current down the middle of the channel, they swam directly into the nets and jerked wildly. Fishers quickly rotated the poles against the current until their hoops touched the river's sandy bottom and triumphantly dragged their catch backward to shore. They packed their coolers to the brim, taking 25 fresh salmon apiece. It's hard to believe that this huge event, which certainly affected the Kanatse's way of life, barely makes a dent in Alaska's fish populations. In Alaska, 95% of rural Alaskan households participate in subsistence fishing, including mammals, shellfish, birds, eggs, and fish. Alaskans harvest about 33.6 million pounds each year. Yet, 
That total subsistence catch for Alaska represents only 0.9% of the tonnage of fish caught in the state, compared to 98.6% or nearly 3.8 billion pounds of fish that are caught commercially. That magnitude of resource extraction does make a dent. And with current commercial activity around the world, some experts predict that nearly all seafood stocks could face 90% depletion by 2050. When I volunteered to take notes in Canada at the 2017 Yukon River Intertribal Watershed Council Summit, far north of where I grew up, chiefs and village representatives repeatedly articulated that commercial fishing reduces salmon runs. By law, the state must preference subsistence use over commercial fisheries. And according to the Alaska Department of Fishing Game, the state has 81 state advisory committees for locals to make recommendations on the management of Alaska's fish and wildlife. But indigenous leaders repeated testimonies did not result in systemic change to fisheries management. One note I'd taken said, quote, we have advisory committees in the village, but no one is required to listen to us. The main way commercial fishing rights are regulated in Alaska, and in fact in many Arctic fisheries, is individual transferable quotas, or ITQs. Fishers with ITQs can catch certain amounts of fish for commercial sale or sell their quotas to other fishers. The problem with the ITQ system is that people with more wealth can afford to catch more fish. Over time, the right to fish increasingly concentrated in the relatively more cash wealthy hands of white men, while indigenous fishers and women have been squeezed out of fisheries. Modern day stereotypes reinforce ideas that white people are the main leaders of environmentalism, creating landscapes of exclusion. In the case of ITQs in Alaska, it was primarily white scientists who set the total catch limits, primarily white people with master's degrees who led the management of ITQs, and now disproportionately white people owning quotas. In Alaska and other Arctic fisheries, Resources that were once available for subsistence are now owned by the highest bidder. As a young adult, my cherished memories outdoors were one reason why I chose to study environmental science and policy. Historically, Black Americans relied on hunting and fishing to supplement their food. The skill was especially useful when low wages did not match the high cost of food during Jim Crow, and before that, when people who claimed my ancestors as property provided insufficient rations. But the pinnacle environmental texts of the 20th century completely excluded Black people. And in a college course about environmental history in North America, I learned some of the modern founders of environmentalism believe wilderness should be untouched by humans, preserved mainly for the exhilaration of the upper class when they felt like leaving the city. Today, federal and state governments continue to enforce the idea that nature must be separated from humans and their economies. The fact of the matter is, though, that indigenous peoples have touched and shaped this landscape for centuries upon centuries. There are very many different indigenous peoples with distinct cultures and traditions. In Alaska alone, there are Nupiak, Yupik, Unangak, or Aleut, Iyak, Klinkit, Haida, Hishmian, and a number of northern Askaba Athabascan peoples. Over after thousands of years of providing for the land, intergenerational knowledge about the environment guides subsistence. As only the second generation to live in Alaska, I don't have that deep knowledge about subsistence and environmental stewardship. Many others before me have argued that Alaska Native people should have more control over their fisheries and other natural resources and should receive adequate funding to do so. After all, Alaska only boasts such rich bounties of fish and wildlife because of the Alaskans who stewarded this land for millennia. So that's the end of the excerpt. As you can see, Welp describes how environmental change is a cultural problem rooted in our relationships with land, water, and natural resources, as well as a policy problem related to our relationships with others. And I'm excited to get to your questions. So Melody, if, I, if you don't mind, I'd like to begin giving some introductions of our panelists. Please do. Okay. So first, I'll start with Michelle Saunders, a policy advisor at Nunatsi Loop Government. And she's actually a contributor to Chapter 15, as I wrote a lot of the chapters with people I met across the Arctic, and a character for readers, you could say. So I'll introduce her in the way it's written in the book. 
I liked Michelle immediately. She came from a small town called Happy Valley Goose Bay and carried that charm with her everywhere she went. She was as cheery as you'd imagine someone from Happy Valley might be and as goofy as a goose. Both of us inevitably insisted on holding the door open when we walked through hallways together. Go ahead, Michelle said. No, you first, I would offer. Ladies first, Michelle responded. We would carry on with this polite fight until someone who wasn't North American would walk through the open door. With two Inuit parents, Michelle grew up on the land. On Canada's Thanksgiving weekend, she used to go hunting with her family. All the cousin children would take turns practicing with bows and every morning she and her cousin were tasked to hunt for partridges. Partridges are the same bird as ptarmigans, the Alaska state bird. And they're known for being so daft that you could walk up to one and catch it with your bare hands. But instead of a partridge, she and her cousin always came back with a bucket of blueberries or raspberries. I'm as tough as nails now, Michelle laughed, but I was kind of squeamish as a kid. My mom used to tease. She's more of a gatherer than a hunter. At the Indigenous Peoples Secretariat, where we both worked, she was most interested in the use of Indigenous people's knowledge in the Arctic Council's research. Michelle said, studying biology at university for the past four years, I noticed a lot of things that I learned from growing up on the land and traditional knowledge in general were missing from the curriculum. Back home, Michelle led a team in documenting photos and stories about birds in Nunatsiavut, the very first Inuit land claims area established in Canada. After learning traditional names and stories about birds from the Inuit who live in that region, her research team ultimately published a book called A Nunatsiavut Field Guide to the Birds of Labrador. Nunatsiavut achieve a level of self-determination under the Nunatsiavut government. It is still part of the Newfoundland and Labrador government, but has the ability to make laws about health, education, justices, community governance, culture, and language in the region. Over to you, Melody. Thank you, Michaela. So um, again, we're going to now hear from uh, Michelle Saunders, policy, policy advisor from Nunatsiavut government. Um, and I will say that the other two that I neglected to introduce in the beginning, you will also hear soon from Larry Ibrahim Mohammed, a PhD fellow at the Arctic University of Norway. And then you will also hear from Dr. Tony Sanset, a researcher at the University of Oslo Center for Sustainable Healthcare. But right now, uh, Michelle, uh, policy advisor to the Nunatsiavut government, who was so wonderfully described, uh, um, in this chapter, I, I want to ask you, how did your studies of biology and traditional knowledge lead you to your role in the Nunatsiavut government? And, um, you know, for those who may not be aware, would you describe how the land claims, um, actually agreements, those foster self-determination in Canada? Thank you, Michaela and Melody. Um, so I guess, you know, as Michaela mentioned in the book, starting at a university in the natural science background and seeing the lack of, you know, traditional knowledge and these voices being used in research, it kind of led me into that field. And then, I mean, from, from there on, the policy gaps and the people that aren't at the table who are making these policy decisions based on this research kind of led me into this role. So I'm currently working for the Nazi government as a policy advisor. Um, some things about, I guess, I can speak mostly to our land claims agreement, which was, which was ratified in 2005. So we do have a level of self-determination, as Michaela said. You know, we have um, we have the ability to manage our lands and non-renewable resources, mining, things like that, which, you know, would usually be up to the provincial or the federal government. So we do have a fair bit of ability there in managing also things like our marine resources, uh, wildlife and plants. So we, we do have a co-management board that actually manages the wildlife plants and fisheries within our region. Um, we also have the ability to adopt laws and things like that. So in my position, which I think is also really important to note that our government is the majority of us are Inuit. We are beneficiaries of the land claims agreement to have people you know like me who not only have the policy experience and seeing from the research side of things, but also the on, on the ground and on the land research like side of things to actually see who do these policies affect, you know, what happens here and things like that. Um, well, thank you. And is there, 
in that space, when you when you read the when you read the book, what did, did you feel that uh, some of the conversations that you had in the book are continued ones that you're having with Michaela uh, today in uh, in understanding some of the uh, inequities that are that are happening in these issues, you know, in these spaces? Absolutely, I think um, me and Michaela, as she said, you know, got along as really good friends as soon as we met. But the similarities between um, being Inuit and being Black in these spaces and the colonialism in, you know, these environmental policies, um, it definitely, where I started kind of in the international side and coming back to my own home government, we have, we're, we're dealing with the same issues even in our regions, let alone on the national stage, that we need more um, young and diverse people sitting at the table and making decisions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Michaela, I will uh, bring you into another. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. And I'm going to move now to Michaela's next excerpt. Yes, um, th that's actually a really good place to move on because, you know, as we're talking about youth and diversity and Arctic diplomacy and policy, um, the next person that I like to introduce is Larry Ibrahim Mohammed. He's a PhD fellow at UIT, the Arctic University of Norway in Tromsø. And he's originally from Ghana and has received two master's degrees at UIT. Uh, he's not new to the Wilson Center stage. And the reason why I say this is a good transition is because I first met him in his position as a um, youth director at Arctic Frontiers, which is a major Arctic conference and um, also a friend of the Polar Institute. And Larry participated as a moderator on a panel about climate change and biodiversity action and research. And in addition to his work with the Wilson Center, he's been a delegate at two youth assemblies of the United Nations in New York and volunteered in the 12th Expert Mechanism on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples in Geneva. So I believe you have a question for him as well. I do. Um, and, but did you want to do a, did you want to do a reading first or no? I just double checking. No, I did mention actually the Arctic in 25 years in the end of the book, because after traveling across the Arctic, I thought it was so important. I had met so many smart, smart and capable young people from across the Arctic. And so um, Michelle included. And, and so um, I thought that uh, it would be good to bring in Larry with his connection to that work into the book. Oh, thank you so much. So, so Larry, my question for you, um, as it relates to the book and, and your own experience is, what do you consider the value that Indigenous peoples bring to environmental policy in the Arctic and around the world? And um, could you explain a, a little bit and tell the audience about green colonialism and how that relates to your research and um, the, the, the work that, uh, uh, that um, Michaela has just mentioned uh, that she talked about in WELP. Yeah, thank you very much and greetings to our audience, um, wherever you are. And I'm seated right here in the Arctic capital of um, Tromso, as you like to call it. I'm very happy to be here and thanks very much, uh, Melody and Michaela for such a beautiful introduction. Um, yes, I mean, when I participated in the Arctic in 25 years symposium, uh, symposium in May, I felt blown away by the strong voices that I heard from, from young people. It, it was su such a watershed moment that I thought that these young people had envisioned a future in 25 years that they will be quit to a younger generation. And they don't want to be uh, pointed at as people who refused or who didn't do anything when they had the chance to, to do something. And so listening to you, uh, Mike, this evening also in terms of the second panel at the Arctic Circle, which also spoke about this, these topics. I, am, I feel really proud um, to be associated with uh, the Arctic in 25 Years Symposium. Indeed, it brings me to that feeling um, from one of the voice of Obama when he said, we did not come, we did not come to fear the future, um, we came to shape it. And I think this is the voice of the young people. Uh, going into and into these discussions about what value do indigenous people bring to um, environmental policy. I think that international law, as 
since for a long time, recognized indigenous people's special role in, in, in environmental sustainability. And we can see this through different frameworks um, in terms of looking at the Real Declaration, the Kyoto Protocol, and now even the Paris um, Climate Agreement, where copious mention of indigenous peoples have been, uh, have been made, especially recognizing their traditional knowledge and the important role that they play in environmental sustainability. And I think that one of the ways we recognize the value of indigenous people's knowledge in this regard is through the, part the participation in impact assessment or environmental impact assessment programs. And within or across the Arctic and places where we have um, indigenous peoples, we see different, um, different governing regime of impact assessment. I mean, I'm very happy to hear uh, Michelle mention about co-management boards that, that they have. Um, it, it, in Norway and in Sweden, we have a different arrangement, right? Where we have um, business-owned impact assessment. So unlike Canada or New Zealand, where you have a community taking active part in drafting impact assessments that have you, you find that the businesses, they have the trump card to produce this impact assessment. And sometimes they do undervalue indigenous people's knowledges and also do not really have enough information about the value of including indigenous people's perspective. And I think that three things quickly about the value of indigenous people. I, I think that um, indigenous people bring different thinking to environmental policy. We are so used to what um, Michaela calls white supremacy. I think this word of white supremacy is uh, a metaphorical word that, that, that speaks to the epistemological injustice that we see around, whereby everything from the Western tradition supersedes every other um, tradition in terms of their ways of knowing and in terms of ways of being and so on. And this has affected how indigenous people's knowledge is valued. And I think that if we begin to look at the important um, thinking that indigenous people bring to this um, topic of environmental sustainability, then we'll be able to achieve a lot of things. And this, the last point I want to make before probably if you have any question I go into it is the, the kind of opportunity that we would have if we begin to to work with two different knowledge systems or two different kinds of knowing. Now I know, for example, in, um, in researches that are conducted on indigenous people's land, if we want to determine what effects wind farms have on reindeer herding, geospatial positioning systems, and even the use of drones in monitoring and conducting research. And I think that these are the possibilities that, that we'll be exposed to um, if we begin to acknowledge different spaces of, of opinion. Um, uh, then we have the topic of green transition or green colonialism. This is really a huge topic, uh, but I'll try to say one or two things. Indeed, as climate change surges, um, the effect of climate changes transcend every border. So those in Accra face it the same as those in Anchorage, if not more. And we, we, it has become really important that we start looking at how to deal with climate change. And energy is one of the biggest um, contributing factor to climate change. And so we find that states and nations are now looking into different energy sources uh, for different reasons. There are, there are a lot of economic reasons, there are a lot of um, geopolitical reasons as why well states are looking at different energy sources. And wind farm or wind energy has become one of the critical ones, especially in Scandinavia. There's been about 91 applications of wind farm uh, applications out of last year. And majority of these wind farm applications in Norway have been granted uh, permission to, to erect wind farms. And this affects indigenous land. Most of in Norway, which is a pressure group in Norway, estimate that about 35.7% of wind energy that are produced in Norway can be found on indigenous peoples. That's the Sami land, which directly affects radio herding. And so this brings critical question as to uh, what are we pursuing? Are we pursuing climate justice to the detriment of other people's livelihood? Uh, so this, these are questions that we need to think critically about. I mean, there are two cases that I can talk about, but probably if uh, we have time later, I can do that. <laughs>
Oh, thank you very much, Larry. This, so this, and this is your current research space, exactly correct? As you're getting your PhD? Absolutely, yes. Oh, um, yeah. <laughs> thank you. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to that because I'm a I'm an academic wonk too, so I'm very excited to, to read more on your PhD. Um, so thank you so much, and we'll come back. Uh, and I wanted to now go to our um, have Michaela introduce our third panelist, and um, that is Dr. Tony Sanset, a researcher with the University of Oslo and the Center for Sustainable Healthcare. Yes, again, very well connected. Um, as Larry brought up, the I talk a lot in the book about white supremacy, and I kind of expand the definition of it than perhaps what is typically thought. So I thought I would bring up my glossary <laughs> and, and read it out, which is it's the belief that white people are superior to other races and should dominate society is the traditional definition. White supremacy is also the reality that white people currently occupy disproportionate power, privilege and wealth. For example, in the United States, white people make up 92.6% of Fortune 500 CEOs, over 80% of nonprofit directors and 88% of senior executive service members in the federal government. And this um, leads me into why I'm introducing and why Dr. Tony Sanset is on here. Um, he is mixed race like me and he wrote um, a book entitled Color That Matters, a, co a comparative approach to mixed race identity and Nordic exceptionalism. And in it, he chronicled interviews with other mixed folks and explained how Norwegianness is often conflated with whiteness, that people expect Norwegians to look a certain way and that you aren't Norwegian if you don't. And it so impressed me that I wrote in the book, quote, we neglect that Americanness is also attached to whiteness. And whenever I traveled in Europe, people commented, you don't look American. I think these um, statistics that I just gave give another example of how when people think about Americans because of our leadership and uh, because of white people particular leadership in American society, then people will assume that Americans are typically white protestant and English speaking. So I will pass it on to um, Melody to ask Tony some questions. Thank you. So my question for you, Tony, in, in um, you know, reading, reading through the book and, 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 and speaking to the questions, the, the issues that uh, Michaela just brought up, that you know, your research does span these topics of mixed identity in Norway to global sexual health. And would you be able to elaborate on the ways that race and racism uh, influences health policy and outcomes in Norway and the US that you have seen from your research and your, and your work in this field? Um, yeah, sure. Thank you, first of all, Melody and Michaela, for um, bringing me onto this panel. It's really nice to to listen in and also to engage with you and the work that Michaela has done. I think this is really, really both important work and, and uh, timely work. Um, I think to speak to the question that you posed, Melody, I think um, working as a researcher at the Faculty of Medicine, um, but with a background in, in um, studies on race and, and ethnicity in Norway, I combined the, the fields of, of um, more medical oriented research with uh, race and ethnicity studies. I think one of the things that we see is obviously that he health disparities, both in Norway and in Norway, uh, both in Norway and in the States, I should say, are highly racialized, right? So we know that there are disparities across racialized lines. Obviously, I would like to note that these also are based on socioeconomic status. So we, we should always keep in mind that these um, uh, health disparities that we see both in the US and in Norway are also uh, the result of disparities of access to resources, socioeconomic standings, uh, and then uh, which is compounded with or entangled with race and, and ethnicity. And in my own research, which primarily is on sexual health, but also more and more on infectious diseases, I've always been, I've been working on HIV and AIDS, but I'm also now more and more this um, transitioned into looking into, for instance, COVID. And I think we probably will get into that later on in the discussion, but I think um, we can see that these, um, these disparities are structured so that if you belong to a certain racialized group, uh, you often have worse health outcomes when it comes to both infectious diseases, but also 
non-communicable diseases, right? And this becomes even more um, exacerbated when it comes to climate, the effect of climate change and disease, right? We know uh, we're starting to see how climate change also affect uh, health outcomes and that these health outcomes aren't, um, it's not like, even though climate change does affect everyone globally, we're probably not sitting in the same boat as we know that racialized minorities will, are being affected harder by uh, diseases um, that are produced by climate change. And we also know that um, racialized minorities are being hit harder, so to say, by climate change due to also socioeconomic um, issues. And this is obviously also the case with indigenous people and the COVID crisis and uh, prior flu pandemics also illustrate this. And I think policy-wise, I think we need policies that also actually engages with social inequality as a vulnerability. We need po good policy, health policies that kind of acknowledges them um, and also make sure that social vulnerabilities are being corrected uh, along racialized lines. I think um, COVID, for instance, preparedness plans, um, I've analyzed, I'm currently writing uh, on an article where I analyze uh, pandemic preparedness plans. And we see that none of the pandemic preparedness plans, either both in the US, Canada, Norway, and the EU, none of them uh, have taken um, into consideration social vulnerability or that ethnic and racialized minorities have been hit harder by, for instance, COVID, but also in the past, they've been hit harder by the so-called Spanish flu. So we, we already knew, know this, and yet we continue to produce policies which are, as the UN have stated, they're leaving people behind. And one of the sustainable development goals, which we at the Faculty of Medicine at the Center for Sustainable Healthcare work with is ensuring that we're not leaving anyone behind, but we know that policies are currently at least when it comes to health, both infectious diseases, but also non-communicable diseases are leaving racialized minorities behind. And this can be obviously produced by um, what we would call structural racism, but also more, um, I wouldn't say benign, but things that has to do with blind spots and biases. And along this continuum from structural racism to uh, biases and blind spots, which we can see there's a continuum here, this continuum really, really affects um, racialized and ethnic minorities, both in the US and in Norway, which obviously as a Nor in a Norwegian context, um, it's kind of odd because we know that Norway and the US have completely different racialized history and often Norway produces this narrative that um, we're exceptionally, uh, we, we, we don't have a colonial history, we uh, haven't been part of uh, the colonial enterprise, even though we probably have in many ways. Uh, yet we see some of the same similarities, which to me is, is both daunting and uh, um, shows that there are commonalities across the Atlantic and in particular across the Arctic. So. Um, I think that was uh, perhaps a, a long um, narrative for that question, but that's at least some ways where we can start thinking about uh, how race and racism um, gets conflated into health and, and produces health outcomes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. And I think, yeah, such a such an important point. And as we come to sort of the uh, the closing of each of you responding to various pieces and, and questions um, specific to the book, I, again, I just wish so much of this book we could even talk more about. And but I'm going to focus on. Um, and I can ask Mikhail if this is okay, but I really want to focus on one question in particular that uh, has come up. Just as I'm hearing all of you speak, um, you know, I'm hearing. I'm hearing what I, I've heard from you before, and it's so important, is these issues of inclusion and respect of diverse ways of knowing, of knowledge, of history, um, and how we get beyond that. And the discussions that I'm hearing are there are these structural inequities baked into our cultures sometimes and becoming more aware of them, which is, I think, a key insight from Michaela's book is that awareness of these baked in pieces. And the question I have for everyone on the panel, so for Tony, Michelle, Larry, and Michaela, is what Michaela asked on page 179 is she, 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 she said, she asked, how do we unlearn the confines of biases that are instilled in us? How do we create a different 
and more just world? She has an answer to this, but before we get to hers, let me ask um, Tony, if you wouldn't, since you're still there, would you mind, how, how do we unlearn these things? How do we help, how do we help the next generation unlearn these biases? Uh, good question and, 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 and a challenging question, but I can, uh, speaking from, um, from the perspective where I'm based, which is uh, once again uh, at the center that tries to now implement sustainable uh, thinking into uh, medical education, I think obviously one of the answers to this question is education, making sure that we can uh, correct blind spots, correct biases, and bring more uh, a broader um, plethora of knowledges to the table when it comes to health and climate. Um, so I think from my, on my side, I think education obviously is an, an important one. Um, and I know that there's a policy audience here and, and obviously policy matters as well. So I think policy and education uh, would be my, my go-to answers here. Thank you so much. Um, if I can, it, can may I ask, I don't want to put you on the spot others yet. Um, let me ask Michaela if you would take a moment to answer that and see if Michelle or um, Larry might also want to chime in. Yes. So what I write in the book is, I believe we need to make changes in government policies, but many of those changes aren't politically viable, not yet. That inclusive and equitable governance will require cultural shifts, inner work, and patience for building new relationships. And the reason why I say that is because, um, as I show in, in that excerpt that I read earlier, these problems that we're creating, these structural um, equities that we're continuously recreating all the time, starts with us as people. You know, it's not just out there. A lot of us have learned a lot of internal biases and it will require a cultural shift on a mass level. And one thing I try to do with this book is really like mainstream some of these concepts like white supremacy, which often people will stay 500 feet away from. Um, I think it's really important that we can talk about these um, very real and very obvious disparities within society and not have it be seen as something that is political because it is uh, supported by scholarship and it is fact in many times that these inequities exist. And so I don't think a lot of people will realize that until they're able to meet others on their same level, build relationships with them to be able to actually listen to what other people have to say about these disparities. And I don't think that we're there yet on a mainstream level. But uh, once we are, then we can start talking about the policies. <laughs> Thank you, that's very, that's really helpful. And Michelle, I was going to come to you next and have the same reflections on how do we unlearn those the structural biases that are in our, in our communities and our governments. I think that's such a, such a tough question because there's so much that goes into it. And I'm just gonna to touch on, well, I guess from, you know, my policy background and things, I think it's so important to support people who, you know, aren't at the table and get them at the table to help unlearn some of these things, you know, let people have their voice, their space to speak up, but also not, um, this might seem like it doesn't really make sense, but maybe not just sending every indigenous kid to school to go get a political science degree and come back and work. I think there needs to be more ways of integrating this knowledge that we have and these these ways of knowing that we've had for years and this new innovation. Thank you. Um, so incorporating diverse ways of knowing and not trying, in, in some respects, trying not using the same knowledge that got us into some of these messes to try to get to try to diversify and think a little differently on the to, to unlearn. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Um, which is not easy, but thank you. Um, Larry, do you have a reflection on this? Yes, um, I would just probably also draw on my personal experiences. I, I mean, reading Michaela, Michaela's book, I, I see a lot of similarities, especially also being black in, in the Arctic. Uh, I have this idea of global citizenship, but Michaela also mentioned as, uh, she mentions it as Arctic citizenship, but I think that global citizenship concept thing that all of us can shine our small corners, we, we can be elements of change in our society. Uh, and I think that I have seen this on few occasions. Um, for example, 
I mean, the events which led me to work at Arctic Frontiers, for example. And when I, I reflect on this, I see myself, and I've said this somewhere, that for, for over a year and a half or two, I thought I was the only person like me who was working in this complex, right? And anytime I enter into this building, I get stares when I go to when I go to the canteen. Obviously, people notice you. And and this took some little work from from university administrators who thought that we should give this boy a chance to go and intern at Arctic Frontiers. And, and so if we all be, be begin to be elements of change and 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 shine a light in our small corners. I think that this will go a long way to to change some of these um, difficulties in terms of um, inclusion. Thank you. Um, and I want to, uh, before I go to a next question to pose to you, I want to open up um, if any of you wants to just comment in general sort of on some of the conversations that happened before. And I wanna give you a moment to think about that. If there's anything that someone brought up in some of these conversations. Or you can just tell me in the chat and I will bring those up, for, but I will move to another question for all of you. And that is that, and it, well, actually it does refer back to the book because I, I, I'm really hoping that folks will recognize that we are hitting on, the book is, as, as all, of we, all of us know, and maybe some in the audience don't, it actually brings these ideas to life in very specific with, with characters, with, um, with stories, with very personal stories that I, Michaela was brave to share um, and that, uh, I, that really bring things home to anyone. And you can understand these experiences um, and then also recognize that as a, as, a, as a white woman, I can't understand them all either, but I need to, hearing them is so powerful and so important for me to, as we talk about unlearning those uh, biases and bringing in new, form, new ways of knowing. Um, but, I, so I, I felt not only inspired and to read the book twice so far and take many notes, but um, also just this new level of awareness and recognizing that there was an awareness with so many others who are rising up in the Arctic spaces. Um, what were each of your, do you have a favorite insight that you might want to share? And I will go first to uh, Michelle, if you have a thought of something that, that um, came up in the book that uh, just inspired you or made you think twice. Um. I think it was just really insightful to me to read, just to read Michaela's take on everything. You know, as I'd said, we were, we were good friends and we'd had some of these conversations, but to, to actually, you know, look at both of our experiences and realize she was thinking the exact same thing that I was, you know, at these conferences and things and all the similarities we have as Michaela being mixed race and myself being indigenous. And actually seeing that from her perspective, which is maybe not said out loud or maybe not as obvious as it is, it was just really, really insightful for me to, and also like really, really nice to feel like I wasn't alone in those situations and things like that. Oh, thank you so much. That was very, very kind to, to share. Um, Tony, did you have any specific thoughts that jumped out at you? Yeah, I think, um, first of all, I thought it was really, really interesting to read the perspective of, of uh, Michaela coming from Alaska and describing her her stay in, in the Nordic, and in particular in Norway, obviously. Um, I think always that that's that's very useful for me as a Norwegian to get in, in uh, another perspective. And I think for me, as once again, in talking about these interconnectedness, um, seeing as I'm based where I'm at, I think one of the things that I think Michaela really did a wonderful job with is to point on the to the interconnectedness of health, uh, environmentalism, and the environment, climate change, and the issue of race. Um, me, as myself, you know, we've we've seen an increased focus on um, the, these interconnectedness, uh, in particular health and and um, climate change in concepts such as planetary health or one health. Etc. But these perspective always tend to um, forget the, another component, component, which is obviously race and, and indigenous populations, right? So we talk about rather big, big terms and rather large connections. But I think Michaela really shows these connection at the micro level, while also really being able to draw some some wonderful larger um, uh, strains of thoughts uh, and connect that to policy. But I think. That really jumps uh, jumped uh, out to me that this 
description of connectedness, which um, even though it's on the radar of, of large bodies of, of funders, et cetera, such as the Rockefeller Foundation, et cetera, I think what Michaela really did was pick on some really, really wonderful um, examples and, and make them into great narratives that connect micro and macro at a level which I think both was wonderfully written, but also had some, some really serious implications that we should take serious. And that is the interconnectedness between uh, humans and nature, climate change, and of course, the topic of race and indigenous people, because bringing these factors together makes uh, for a very rich uh, description of an important topic and a very timely topic, obviously. Thank you. Um, so Michaela and Larry, I'm going to go actually to, to Michaela uh, first, actually, just a, a, a reflection on your own as you read this book back. Um, are there pieces of it that you, you know, in, you were talking about the policy space and the, the changes in education policy to really address some of these issues of um, uh, education um, and, and policy change for, for bias and for systemic racism? What else, what else just made, made this book um, so so important to you that you're now going to to not only speak about those issues, but the some of the other issues of your personal life and your and your future of how, how you take how you want to take this forward. What is what is calling to you on this in this uh, space? Well, for one, it's really nice to hear everyone's compliments. <laughs> but, um, um, it gives me confidence that I'm not just making things up. And um, and we know that we're not this is what Michelle actually said about, um, you know, education is an important tool, but also uh, sometimes when you go into a Western education, often they're teaching you these Western principles and, and a lot of the um, patterns of the past of trying to get rid of people's traditional knowledge or whatever people have, their parents have passed down to them really hasn't changed all that much. Um, like there was just an example in Anchorage at this past graduation where people weren't allowed to wear their traditional regalia. And someone asked, well, how is this different from um, the school, the residential schools, really what has changed? Mm -hmm. And so, so one thing that I really enjoyed looking back on the book um, was seeing that people, just showing how through these individual stories, as well as through these larger stories, these larger narratives, that in fact, these solutions that we're looking for, for climate change and for systemic you know, racism and other large institutionalized problems, perhaps we already have the solutions and they're just not being brought to the forefront of the policy discussion because the right people are not in the room. And that a lot of the knowledge about how to have health outcomes, um, for example, healthy outcomes living in the Arctic um, has been passed down through thousands and thousands of years, and yet there was intentional and currently is intentional um, policy making in order to get rid of all of that knowledge and assimilate it, people into Western societies, um, often in order to make money. And so um, that is something that I think is really important throughout the book that isn't uh, that I hear a lot in my own circles, but that I don't hear often in policy circles. And so um, my favorite part about the book is just being able to uh, like amplify these things that I hear often um, among Black and Indigenous people around me, but that I don't hear amplified in mainstream media and in policy discussions. That we already have the solutions in front of us, but maybe we're not bringing the right people into those Yes. Yes. Thank you. That's that's very. It's so important to me to hear. And thank you. And it's why you why I brought you into my class, as you know, because that's the voice I want to. I, I am so I'm so excited that you're bringing to everyone. And let me go to you, Larry, because if this touches on a lot of your research and your ideas. Is this does this book? Are there places in this book and that uh, in your work that are really that sense of um, not being heard and um, how how that can change in these spaces, is that part of what you're studying as well or what you work on? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if I had um, someone read Michaela's book, I would just jump off my seat and probably say they were describing my life in another sense, right? Um, I feel that Michaela does it in a very nice way. She goes 
deeply professional and she goes deeply personal. Um, for example, she talks about uh, mental health issues and addiction about her in, in her family. She's talking. She's spoken about experiences of unequal representation, um, being alone, and I mean a lot of frank stories that like hit hard at me, especially when I when I reflect on this. But one of the one of the scenes that stands out to me and also related to my work is, I mean, that episode with. Um, Ola Anta, is it? When I mean, you 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 went to the tundra and you lived there. And you saw how rainy head and cedar are organized and, and and so on. It it's it's it, it crystallizes my idea of all this debate about wind farms on indigenous people's lands and how it affects or may not affect indigenous people's reindeer herding. Um, I was in New York in 2020 and. As, as you rightly mentioned, Michaela, on uh, the Youth Assembly, and we had this session on renewable energy. And I asked one of the resource person whether he knew about re research that showed that wind farms were inimical to reindeer herding. I mean, he, that was the first time he ever heard about it. And, and this is the same thing, uh, the same discourse in, in Sweden when businesses meet indigenous peoples and when they meet the Sami people, some of them even refuse to acknowledge their indigeneity because they think they are all Caucasians, they are all white, they are, they are, they are, it's different from the way it is from New Zealand, uh, in Canada. So these stories, as you share, um, these are the reality of indigenous peoples. And I really feel, passionate about it. Last week, um, there was a decision from the Supreme Court in Norway on one of the critical cases of um, wind farm called the Fossin wind farm. Um, the High Court had ruled uh, against the indigenous peoples. It was sent to the Appeals Court. The, the ruling was upheld. And then the Supreme Court saw that um, the license that was given to the Fossin wind, wind energy to, to construct the biggest wind farm in Europe was illegal or would be injurious to indigenous people. So the court quashed that um, decision down. And for me, that also reminds me of one of the powerful saying of Archbishop Desmond Tutu, when he said that if an elephant has its foot on the tail of a mouse and you say that you are neutral, the mouse would not appreciate your neutrality. And I think that is the case. Thank you. Um, that, that will be a phrase I will try to remember. Thank you very much. Um, I was going to have a question here about, to, I think actually this, I'll let uh, uh, Michaela talk about this, and this goes to our issues of structures and, uh, and addressing biases. How, so could you tell us more about your work with the Indigenous Peoples Secretariat and what that is and how it is in the Arctic Council and how that is a piece of inclusive governance that the Arctic is trying to model and showcase for the rest of the world? Yes, and maybe Michelle would like to step in as well. She might have some reflections on it. Um, so yeah, the Indigenous People Secretariat is part of the Arctic Council Secretariat, which organizes the events and all of the um, work of the Arctic Council. And the Indigenous People Secretariat in particular works under the direction of the six indigenous organizations which have permanent participant status in the Arctic Council. So these are organizations that have existed since before the Arctic Council actually was created in some instances such as the Russian Association of Indigenous Peoples, the Inuit Circumpolar Council and the Sami Council and um, three more, the Arctic Athabascan Council, Aleut International Association and the Gwich'in Council International came in um, later throughout the history of the Arctic Council. And uh, this year is the 25th anniversary of its creation. So really the, it's a kind of was a place, it was in a, it was an organization before its time in that um, starting in 1996, they had um, permanent participants sitting around the exact same table as the Arctic states in creating um, policy and cooperation across the Arctic region. And, um, you know, they were not invited necessarily at the beginning, they did have to come and, and then, you know, Mary Simon from Canada was one of their main advocates um, in the Arctic Council that was uh, pushing that Indigenous people should have a seat here 
in um, making Arctic policy. And that's not really a, a forum or a model of a forum that is anywhere else in um, international governance. And so that's why I'm so interested in Arctic policy because I see that um, there are avenues for people of color, of you know, indigenous peoples in particular to um, speak on their own behalf and create some methods of self-determination. Yeah. Thank you, Michelle, did you want to also bring some words to that? Thank you. Yeah, I was just gonna jump in about how um, the idea of inclusivity and being at the table, which is true, they are at the table, but I think it is also important to note that the permanent participants don't have the same uh, voting ability yes. that the nations do. And that it's also kind of interesting when we talk about self-determination and land claims, like for example, the Labyrinth land claims form the Nazar government. The Nazar government is part of Inuit Circumpolar Council. So we're trying to say, you know, we're self-determined and we're sovereign. But then you look at the international stage and ICC, Inuit Circumpolar Council, can't actually vote on these things, mm. but the nation of Canada can. Yeah, so it's consensus, but if, if the states are not backing up with permanent participants are saying, then, you know, then it's not necessarily that they actually have a, a voice in the discussion. It's still important that they're there, but there are these real limits that, um, you know, some people have actually been pushing for um, the permanent participants to have voting rights at the Arctic Council table. Yeah, thank you. And and so the that is that is how in some respects so many of you met or con connected around the the work of the Indigenous People Secretariat being you know co coordinating those voices. But as you mentioned, it's still the structures are more inclusive. But it's um, what's the word? It's 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 not it's it's there, but no, it's not it's not sufficient. It's it's mm. it's better, but not sufficient. I'm, I'm not using the phrase correctly, but um, and that's something I think that is when we get to these issues that are so clear on environmental policy and structural inequalities and racism, um, how we address it is always going to be a challenge. And as we unlearn, as we try to unlearn biases and find new systems, um, it's, it's a work very much in progress. But as I think I, I share the thought and hope that the Arctic Council is one model that at least could start conversations in a very different way than just nation, nation governments having the full say. So I really appreciated that that's kind of the work that was really where you were focused in meeting all these and, and putting these ideas together, but really bringing up the awareness. Um, another question I'm hearing is, um, is obviously this, all of these issues in a time of COVID. Um, and I know that Tony may have more, you said you might have more say on this. So I'll go, maybe go to you first, but when you wrote, well, uh, Michaela, it, you know, it, it was, <laughs> it, you concluded it right as uh, COVID pandemic um, was beginning. Um, and then you, when we have these issues of, of, of a pandemic and climate change, um, and I think so many of us have seen the parallels, um, and the intersectionality of all sorts of identities that come into these issues. And as, as, as Tony was talking about, and I'll have you say more, as I said, um, how, Tony, I'll go to you, how do you suggest, um, and, and you said this before, but maybe elaborate a little bit on how do we approach policymaking to adapt to these, the intersectionalities and the inequalities that are present and how, you know, how do you structurally do that? And, you know, we know we have to be more aware. How, again, do you start to really address these for the next pandemic, for the climate uh, crisis that is on us now, and that we're trying to think of adaptation issues? Is there anything in your sort of the, the work you do on uh, and health and, 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 and race and racism that uh, helps you think, help us think about how we approach these um, ideas in a different way to get a solution that is much more inclusive and equitable? Thank you, Melody. I, I think, um... There's a couple of ways we could illustrate this, I think. First, a very concrete one, which has to do with policy and preparedness plans, for instance, is um, here in Norway, there's a bit, been a discussion because we've seen that, for instance, racialized minorities were both at uh, larger risk for a COVID infection, but also once they got COVID, they were also at larger risk of severe outcomes, whether that is measured as, as days in on a respirator or death. And one of the things that we, we knew this um, beforehand, and there's good data 
that builds on, for instance, vulnerabilities among indigenous people as well when it comes to pand pre pandemics. So one concrete thing that we're up for discussion here in Norway, at least, was that perhaps uh, racialized minorities and indigenous people should get be prioritized when it comes to vaccinations, for instance, because they are already put at greater risk because of systemic issues, right? Uh, but if you look at preparedness plans, none of the preparedness plans, and I, I, I said this earlier, none of the preparedness plans that we've analyzed have ever actually noticed this and taken to heart the social vulnerabilities of uh, minorities, whether that be racialized minorities or indigenous peoples, right? So this is a concrete example of how we can build preparedness policies better by including social vulnerabilities into those plans not just uh, talking about personal protective equipment, et cetera, but also thinking about the social environment that people live in as a risk factor. And then obviously rectify these social structures because you know we, could, we can vaccinate and prioritize all we want, but if we don't necessarily address the underlying systemic um, barriers and structures, then these vulnerabilities won't be corrected. So that's, that's one concrete way of doing it. When it comes to the, the intersection of climate and emerging uh, infectious diseases, we know for a fact that there will be more pandemics. We see that the, the increased rates of infectious diseases uh, transmitted from animals to humans have increased. Uh, and we know that this is a result of climate change, but also the result of increased human activities into wildlife zones, for instance, by um, um, logging, mining, etc. More contact, contact with nature, uh, more extractive contact with nature, and by extractive I obviously mean, for instance, mining or, or timber logging, will result in more contact with uh, animals that carry zoonotic diseases. And with climate change, this will only increase. So I think um, well, it's, it's a rather large question, obviously, because there's many different moving parts here, but one way of introducing policies would be to have more sustainable um, uh, ways of, of uh, engaging with nature, whether that is through mining or logging, etc. Uh, we need more sustainable um, policies that also uh, acknowledges that by um, um, humankind's meeting with nature, is also contact with animals that perhaps pose, have different virus vectors. We need to also, it is our interest actually to become more sustainable uh, if we are to avoid rather, or at least um, somewhat avoid um, large pandemics in the future. So I think this is a complex question, but there are, we do have tools and it, it does have to do with regulation, for instance. It has to do with putting, uh, people over profit and not the other way around. It has to do with correcting uh, systems which marginalizes people in such a way that it pushes people to become vulnerable. And I think here is where we can have policy, but also like Michaela says, there needs to be a cultural change where that cultural change is also acknowledging human vulnerabilities and also dependencies, not just upon each other, but also upon the very ecosystem that we inhabit. So I think uh, that's my long and rather large uh, answer to that question. But I, I, there are tools to be made here or to be used, I think. Well, I, and I'm, I'm starting to think that, Michaela, in front, after you get through your book tour, we're going to have to do WELP, the, the, the policy manual. Um, <laughs> so it's going to operationalize. You have both personal and professional reflections throughout this book, and then we need to have your we will now actually operationalize these and and give exactly what Tony just did. It's you know these are the policy recommendations <laughs> yes. that that um, that we know you're, you, you're you're engaging the awareness. You're bringing these ideas very boldly and blatantly to the fore. You're not pulling punches. And okay. And now what what and you say in the book what needs to be done. But it may it may need its own its its own. Uh, a publication and so let's talk. <laughs> yeah. Could I add something to that? Please do. Um, yeah, the discussion that we've been having made me think about, you know, we also need to move beyond diversity and inclusion to really meaningful engagement. And so like Michelle was talking about, you can have permanent participants sitting around the table but they have to be meaningfully engaged and that they also have to be funded adequately in order to prepare for these meetings. 
Um, and, and beyond that, I mean, there's a, there's a lots of different manuals and ways, actually ICC, Inuit Circumpolar Council just released one on community engagement um, guidelines. Mm -hmm. uh, but beyond that as well, I think uh, one of the things I wrote in the book was that I really follow this just transition movement, which is how do we move from a currently um, kind of uh, extractive economy into one that is regenerative? And how do we do that in a way that brings people along as well? And so in the end of the book, I give some of the recommendations that are really straight out of the just transition movement. So again, there are these solutions out there and we just need to be paying attention to them. Thank you. Um, uh, and uh, so for the audience, um, just so you know, I'm, thank you for some of the questions. And then there is also a uh, Polar, if for those of you may be joining, it's polar at wilsoncenter.org. And we have a few, uh, about 20 more minutes, and I want to uh, keep going with the panelists with the questions I have. Um, so I'm going to say one of the questions here is, um, you know, we get back to the interconnectedness and um, how... Uh, so I think maybe for some folks who, you know, they in policy land, this gets a little bit to building on, you said that, you know, there's the just transitions work, but why and how do can policymakers start to address things that you know Tony was talking about, um, and Michelle has mentioned, uh, Larry and you have all talked about these interconnected issues, and policy likes to be sometimes in silos. Um, so how do you start to bring in health, security, environment, racism? How, again, um, you know, there's no perfect easy answer here, but when you're talking about the interconnectedness, which is a core theme of this book, it's, it's, it's personal, it's policy, it's, it's, it's experience. Um, how can, would each of you start to think about um, s s helping the folks in the policy world understand why encouraging that interconnectedness, those dialogues about the interconnectedness are so critical. Um, I'll start with you, Michaela, actually. Yes. So how do we start to break down those silos and, and be interconnected in our work? Um, the first thing that came to my mind was that the um, Crystal, uh, her last name is escaping me, but who was the, the president of the Inuit Youth Council um, of Canada? She taught, came to the Arctic in 25 years and was talking about how a lens of cultural safety really needs to be applied to everything that we're doing, all policies, and that that's currently not being done. Um, and that if we were to take that up, kind of in the way that Tony is talking about really um, just recognize, recognizing the interconnectedness to begin with would require um, us to really recognize that race and um, identity plays a huge factor in all of the policies that, um, that we could possibly make. And um, so that would, be, that would be one way, I think. And then um, the other way to really bring up interconnectedness and policy I think interdisciplinary work is really important. Um, and I talk about a little bit of that in the book, um, but in particular in the book, I talk about co-production of knowledge and how there needs to be ways to connect policymakers to, as Michelle said, indigenous communities, like in the communities that they're in, not by training them and bringing them out elsewhere. And so this is another way that we could kind of influence the ways that we're thinking about policy, not just in a Western way, but by really building strong connections with identity-based communities and, um, and bringing in their knowledge systems. So it's an active not waiting, not waiting for that those voices to come to the, pol the, the Western policy table, but actually the active outreach, compensation, support, and um, an engagement of the voices in the north and well around the world, but we're talking mostly in the Arctic and climate policy, but it's intentional active outreach and engagement of diverse ways of knowing, not on Western terms, but on the terms of those communities. Michelle, would that, I'm, I'm, you please say it better than I can. No, I think you got it there. Just the, 
when when you first asked the question, it kind of to me, I'm like, that's obvious. Like you look at everything holistically. It's not the sum, you know what I mean? It's all, everything together, not just separating, okay, this part, this part, this part, this part. And I think, I don't know if this will kind of sound harsh, but like sometimes we're in meetings and stuff and someone will talk about a policy and immediately I'm like, that'll never work because you're not thinking of this other thing or I don't know. If, I don't know if I'm saying this right. I don't think I'm saying it any better. But this holistic approach that is very indigenous in nature as well is that everything is interconnected. It's not environment, economy, you know, culture. It's all of that together that makes us who we are. Thank you. And it's it's not how we're necessarily taught or academia academia is framed or nor government is framed. So you're talking. I mean, it's radical. And it's important. It's radical and it's not because it's how humans have lived in other spaces for a very long time. Um, Larry, do you have a reflection on this? Yeah, um, I think that most of it has also been said by Michaela and also Michelle, I think. Um, but I also want to say that we, we should recognize gap by inequality. Um, aside of what has been said, I am thinking about um, the agenda setting organizations in the in the Arctic. Now, conference has become a, an important platform for exchange knowledge in, uh, knowledge systems and also bringing different people together at one uh, platform where we can get to hear all these sub levels of, of problems. And so um, this agenda setting, which, which I think um, some of the conferences and um, Arctic platforms we have like Arctic Circle, Arctic Frontiers have become um, really good platforms to set the, um, the agenda of issues within the Arctic. And I think that if we have uh, decision makers um, pay attention to all of these um, levels of interaction that happens with, uh, within these conferences where we have um, different perspectives, then we would go one step ahead um, and kind of uh, sampling all of these um, different different issues. And the second, the second part is also for indigenous peoples, which of course that is my 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 focus and my field, to enhance the capacity of indigenous people to be able to participate in these arenas where where these so-called arenas where we have as um, agenda setting, uh, because with, without it, then we would would continue to fold one side of narration or narrative um, to the exclusion of others. Thank you, uh, Tony. I'm going to ask you the, this one reflection on this, and I have a, a final potential final question and statement for, to, for everyone, but Tony, on, on issues of intersectionality and um, reflections there. Um, yeah, I, I would just, um, first of all, I, I agree with what the rest of the panelists have said, and I think connecting it to policy, I think, first of all, I think policies needs to be also uh, in many ways, uh, bottom-up driven in these contexts. It needs to not just be top top down. Um, working with the, for instance, for myself, working with the sustainable development goals when it comes to health, we know that there's a problem with top down uh, approaches when it comes to policies, when it comes to health, we need bottom up. Uh, and we also need, for instance, when policymakers uh, and this is this has been the rage for a long time, as many of you probably know, but indicator driven policies where you put some sort of indicator, you're going to reach a target within such and such deadline. But we know that a lot of these indicators and targets are not necessarily set by the communities themselves. The indicators are rather, uh, first of all, articulated by expert panel or uh, a panel of experts. And those indicators and metrics and even targets might not resonate with local communities. And they certainly, in many cases, might not take into consideration holistic approaches. They're often very much siloed in. Uh, so I think those are my two main like points when it comes to, to interconnectedness and trying to translate that into policy. We need more bottom-up um, approaches and we need indicators as a colleague of mine said we need indicate indicators that are made in, so to speak in the communities themselves that are meaningful targets and indicators for the communities themselves um, and not just being articulated by experts i think i i actually have this is exact i've, I've wondered if there and i think there has been a somewhat of a movement of sort of an 
Arctic Community SDG, because I do think that has, I don't know how much those conversations have really happened outside of the European world sometimes in the sustainable development goals. I know there's a lot of adoption of sustainable development goals, but I would love to hear of more on ground up discussion of those ideas, if they're even relevant and how they should be, maybe could be relevant um, in the Arctic spaces. So I thank you. I, that's, I think about that too. Um, one, I have a sound outside my door. I apologize for that. Um, but one thing I wanted to uh, next go with, and, and this is on climate, uh, um, a, a focus on what we, is, Michaela, I'm going to put you your advice to young people. Um, and this is, so in, in terms of of, a, of going to these issues of, of climate and structural uh, inequities and, and, and race issues. You wrote, you said you gave advice to young people in your book and I highlighted it. And I'm, um, you said advice to all people who want to go far. And I would say, and be meaningful. You said, jump on any opportunity that is given to you and make something bigger of it. Always ask for more and always ask twice. So for all of you, if you were guiding and you know, next, we have policy folks on this, uh, on this call, I'm sure we have international folks. I hope we have some young people too. If you're speaking to the next generation on these issues and we've been talking about the challenges we're facing and the structural things that we need to change and the voices are there already to fix it. How does, how does our next generation um, think about and take Michaela's words, jump on the opportunities, make something of it, ask for more and ask twice and how can how might they be able to use their voice um, in in helping us fix these problems and find a more sustainable and just world i'll go to you first okay <laughs> yeah I, I saw the michaela <laughs> um i i think that yeah I, one of the things that i am kind of straightforward about in the book is that i came from a relatively privileged place in alaska having been in highly gifted programs and going on to Duke University and that these are not things that are necessarily um, readily available for people across the Arctic and youth across the Arctic. And, and that oftentimes that's not necessarily what people want even, like people want to be able to live in their own communities and be educated in their own communities. And that's a good thing. And so um, I think that if ever there are opportunities to, and that you have the privilege to be able to give in those opportunities, then jump on them and take advantage of them and ask for more. Um, and I think I think that I don't have the answers for all youth because everybody has their own paths. Um, but I think that there are so many smart people um, that could be doing this work that I'm doing that simply have not had those opportunities given to them. So for also the policy audience that's watching, it's important that if you, you know, see someone who, uh, who has that potential, but you know might not have those opportunities being given to them, then it is your responsibility um, to, to bring those people into the forefront of the policy discussion. And that's what I try to do here at the Polar Institute. Awesome, thank you. Larry, to you, how would you speak to the next generation? Well, I, I will tell them that I think they have the power to reimagine the world as they want it to be. Um, be I am from, maybe I would say, an underprivileged um, society and community. And I feel that with little more pushing and the desire to be at where the action is, you know, um, that has seen me also rub shoulders with a lot of important people, <laughs> um, in quote. And so, I, I, I felt that they, should, they shouldn't they give up. They should work on themselves and work on their convictions if they, are convic uh, if they have a conviction on one particular um, course of action, which is the right one. They should give a shot at it and, and go for it. Thank you. I will go next to Michelle, your words. I love those words so much. And I'm definitely somebody who um, has taken every opportunity and made the best of it as well. And coming from, you know, an, also an underprivileged place, um, it's difficult to not even to do those things, but to even have the confidence to like ask to do those things or have that. I think it's really important for people, as Michaela said, giving them the privilege to speak and things like that. It only takes one person to, to help someone get to a point where they can take advantage of opportunities or they can do they can realize they can do whatever they want with their life. 
there was there was a talk I listened to once where um, a professor, an indigenous professor, someone asked her, how do you get more indigenous people to go to graduate school? How do you get them into those programs? And she said, ask them. And that is exactly, you know, what happened to me. My my prof said, do you want to go to grad school? And that's that's all it, you know, something I thought was completely out of reach, out of touch, ridiculous. It takes one person to to make that happen. Thank you. I agree. Tony, next one. I agree with everything that's been said, so I'll be pretty brief. But I think my advice would also be to be curious, ask questions, um, use the word why, why. Be curious to as to why things are as they are. And don't take um, the status quo or politics or whatever it is that you're interested in for granted. Be be curious. I think that's a very um, that's a um, that's a very valuable um, approach to the world. It will probably also lead you to unexpected places, which I think um, oftentimes gives re really really good insights, and you get to meet a lot of different people through being curious about other people and the world. Thank you. Um, with just a few minutes left, I'm going to hand the, 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 the stage to our author, Michaela. And, but I will say that what really, I hope that you might say um, and continue to say, thank you, Tony, for ask why and don't settle for the status quo. And Michelle, you have a voice and some people should hopefully will ask, but if they don't ask, step into it. Um, and uh, you know, Larry, ask those questions. Uh, just all of thank you all for your um, stepping up to these ideas. I just I say this because as a professor, I do see this is where I, I hope my and why I brought Michaela in is um, these are the voices. Uh, it's so important to have them. And if we have to ask for them and pull them forward and they step up, then we have to open doors. So Michaela, in the final moments, anything you would like to just you know finalize in, in, in how you're going to continue uh, bringing this book to others and what we can do to help. Yes, um, I just wanted to say thank you also. I so appreciate all of the panelists' nice smiles and very intelligent um, contributions to this panel. And um, so I don't have I don't have much to say because I think you all have said everything in the in the book that I wanted to be discussed, except perhaps you know um, the the environmental security aspects of climate change. We've touched on it a little bit, um, particularly Tony did, uh, but I think that this is a, people often talk about climate change in policy and in academia, and that the human effects of climate change are something that we could really be perhaps directing more research to and, and co-production of knowledge around it, not just doing top-down research, but really looking at people in communities that are being hard hit by climate change and what um, sorts of studies would help them to increase their everyday economic or um, environmental security would be really important. Um, so, so after this talk, I do have a autumn virtual speaking tour. I'll be speaking at Columbia University with their students for environmental action at um, UNC, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill with their Center for Public Service and as well as some local bookstores um, here in Washington DC where I am now at Lost City Books will be having an in-person book talk. So I very much look forward to seeing everyone there. Well, thank you to Michaela Stith, our author of Welp, Climate Change and Arctic Identities. And just so everyone knows who's watching this, you can purchase this book at books at Wilson, link on the webpage on this event's website. Um, and my huge thanks to Michelle Saunders, to uh, Tony Sansett and to Larry uh, Ibrahim Mohammed for your thoughts, insight and being part of this. And Michaela, I look forward to many more conversations and many more books. And uh, thank you for all you all are doing. Thanks to Wilson Center as well. Thanks very much for hosting. Bye-bye.